Hello, everyone. My name is Alka Chave, and I will be talking about our high-resolution view of D4, Z4 repeat regions for studying fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy using whole genome optical mapping. So let me introduce myself. I am the head of cytogenomics for Perkin Elmer Genomics. And Perkin Elmer Genomics has a global laboratory network. And you can see in this slide that we have laboratories in India, in Malaysia, in China, in uh, Sweden. And we have two laboratories in the United States, one in Brantford and in, and in Pittsburgh. With this kind of global structure, it, is, um, it becomes necessary to have a setup where enriched data set from diverse populations across the globe can be tailored um, for variant interpretation and for disease diagnosis. We have director offices in Atlanta where all the information for uh, genetic genomic testing is essentially analyzed, interpreted, and reported from here. So our goal has been to have a comprehensive continuum of care. Perkin Elmer, for the most part, has been heavily involved in uh, prenatal and uh, newborn screening and moving towards diagnostic services, uh, both in pediatric and adult, and of course, going towards preconception and prenatal is to have this complete cycle of care. So Perkin Elmer Genomics has a very exhaustive genomic test menu, which includes whole genome sequencing, where we interrogate the sequencing variants and copy number variants along with the mitochondrial genome. We also have whole exome sequencing, focused exome sequencing, where again, we are able to report sequencing variants and copy number variants. But we also have a low pass whole genome sequencing test which we, which we call as copy number genome for high resolution CNV detection. But for the purpose of this talk, I want to focus on our comprehensive neuromuscular disorder panel, where we have a limb girdle muscular dystrophy panel and an expanded neuromuscular disorder panel. As part of these two panels, one thing that is lacking is we are not able to report for FSHD. So there's clearly a need for us to complement our neuromuscular disorder panel with FSHD testing, where we used bionanogenomics Sapphire as the tool of choice to validate as a laboratory developed test or an LDT. So fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy or FSHD is the third most common form of muscular dystrophy. And the incidence worldwide is between one in 10,000 and one in 25,000 individuals. There are two types of FSHD, FSHD1 and FSHD2, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about it in the next slide. However, one of the classic symptoms of FSHD is the scapular winging, which you see in the image on the top right-hand side. Along with this unique clinical feature, there can be facial weakness, atrophy of the upper arms, abdominal weakness causing lordosis, lower leg weakness causing foot drop, chronic pain, retinopathy, and high tone sensory neural loss. Now the FSHD, as I just mentioned, is of two types. FSHD1 is of autosomal dominant inheritance and is seen in approximately 95% of cases. On the other hand, FSHD2 is seen in approximately 5% of cases and there is diagenic inheritance here. Now let's try and understand why it is absolutely um, imperative to understand the genetic mechanism of FSHD and why this causes problems in routine diagnostic testing. So FSHD um, one is because of there is a D4Z4 repeat array, approximately 3.3 KB unit in size on chromosome 4Q35. Now the normal range of this repeat cluster or repeat array is 11 to 100 units. But distal to this repeat cluster, there is a 10 KB, KB polymorphism, which is either A or B, and that actually uh, ascertains the A or B haplotype on chromosome 4Q35. So 
In the normal situation, the chromatin is closed because of this D4Z4 cluster. However, if there is a repeat contraction between one to 10 units, then, and in the presence of the A haplotype of the polymorphism, this results in FSHD phenotype expression. Now, keep in mind that you can have the same repeat contraction, but in the presence of the B haplotype, there is no expression of FSHD phenotype. Now, this is compounded by the same D4Z4 repeat array on chromosome 10Q, which has approximately 99% homology between 4Q. So it becomes really important to be able to discern the 4Q and the 10Q D4Z4 cluster. So with this repeat contraction, what happens is that the chromatin opens, which leads to the polyadenylation and then the expression of the DUX4 protein in the muscle, and that is what leads to muscular dystrophy. However, in FSHD2, this is associated with the SMCHD1 gene on chromosome 18P11.32, and this gene is the structural maintenance of chromosome hinge domain 1. Now, patients with SMCHD1 mutation have a profound hypomethylation of chromosomes 4 and 10. Now, along with this repeat contraction on chromosome 4Q, if you have one to six repeats, then the disease severity is dependent upon the repeats also. If you have repeats between seven to 10, then you could be an asymptomatic carrier because you need hypomethylation uh, to be able to express into the disease phenotype. So looking at this com complexity of the disease and phenotype expression, it is, you can see that there are essentially challenges to accurate diagnosis of FSHD. If you look at the publications from 1999 to uh, 2019, you can see in 20 years, a lot of publications uh, discuss how the hypomethylation, how the genetic and epigenetic events lead to the abnormal expression of the DUX4 transcript, and then how SMCHD1 mutations. And now we have this recent article where single molecule optical mapping enables quantitative measurement of these repeats in FSHD patients. So we decided to adopt the whole genome optical mapping approach using BioNano Sapphire whole genome imaging. What this involves is that if we, once we have isolated high molecular weight DNA, which is a requirement for this technology so that we can accurately map the 4Q and 10Q molecules, then that isolated DNA is labeled with a specific fluorophore across the genome at a, at a, a sequence specific motif. Then that labeled DNA is then linearized in the Sapphire chip using these nanochannel arrays. And the single molecules are then imaged in the sapphire and then digitized. And there are algorithms that convert these images into these molecules. And then there is a de novo assembly that constructs the consensus genome map. And then it is compared to a reference where um, we can then identify structural variations happening on either chromosomes or the genome. So the important part here is that the whole genome is actually imaged. However, for this specific um, uh, clinical indication, we will be using BioNano's and Focus tool for FSHD analysis. And there are huge advantages to using this specific tool. One is that you can have a sample to answer in three days. So on day one, if you see 12 samples can be processed in a day and the hands-on time is essentially four hours. On day two, there is approximately two hours of hands-on time. And again, that is where the labeling uh, happens with the DLE enzyme. On day three, what you can see over here is that six samples can be processed and essentially we can have data in less than 1.5 hours per sample. We're using this focused analysis. So the main focus is 
One, can we uh, accurately map the 4QA, which is the pathogenic, and the 4QB haplotypes? The number two, can we accurately measure the D4Z4 repeat arrays on chromosome 4Q? Also, we can uh, visualize and see if there are any structural variants or copy number variants proximal to the D4Z4 repeats. And we can also report any copy number variants proximal to the SMCHD1 on chromosome 18. All this information is then reported in a result file, which also includes the images for the user to visualize and, and uh, look at the data. In this slide, what I'm trying to show you is that um, in the bottom uh, image, this is the BioNano map without repeat contraction. And in purple, you can see the D4Z4 repeat, which is a control sample without FSHT with the 4QA haplotype. However, in the top part now, you, I hope it is really clear to all the viewers that the repeat contraction, that purple rectangle, is from a known sample that has the FSHD phenotype. So it is visual, it is very clear, and we can actually map the number of repeats based on the size also. So as part of a, a CLIA LDT, there are essential requirements. One is the um, equipment IQ, OQ, and AQ. And this is, there is actually no customer or lab responsibility because the vendor provides the certifications for the installation of the equipment and passing all the QC wow. metrics. However, every lab has to have their own validation, uh, standard operating procedure. And of course, we have to look for clinical samples that are available for validation. Do we have enough positive controls? And how are we going to measure the performance metrics of this test? So we have to have a robust standard operating procedure for any test. And then the personnel competency and training. And then based on our validation, what is the validation report? And then this has to be signed off by a CAP or CLIA director. So for any LDT, the performance metrics that uh, can be used are analytical specificity, analytical sensitivity, accuracy, precision, uh, what is the reportable range based on assay cutoffs? What is the uh, detection limit? And any other performance characteristics. So we measured inter-site re reproducibility, intra-site reproducibility, inter-operator reproducibility, and inter-instrument reproducibility as part of this validation. So the total number of samples that were tested by whole genome optical mapping were 44. Six of these were Coriel uh, FSHD positive cell lines, and they were run in triplicate in three independent runs. We also had three normal male samples and three normal female samples, and we had 14 clinically diagnosed FSHD patients, and six of those samples were run in duplicate, and I'm going to show the data um, a, a little bit later. We measured the performance metrics as mentioned here and I, as I just explained on the previous slide. And as part of software optimization and reporting, we had 58 normal controls that were analyzed for the presence or absence of the contracted 4QA allele using the NFOCUS FSHD analysis pipeline. And we customized the reports for reporting the 4Q uh, the 10Q and the 18P regions as part of this test. So I want to show you the clinical symptoms and the samples that were recruited as part of this validation. And there were 14 uh, samples and the images are from patient number 11. And this was a family that had a history of FSHD and, and I hope that everybody can appreciate the scapular winging, which is so clearly evident in this individual. But there are two cases where I've highlighted, 773 and 918, and I will show this again uh, when I discuss the data. So whenever we are running any assay, there are certain QC metrics that you know have to pass when we are running the assay. So for this um, uh, Sapphire also, 
there are specific QC metrics that need to pass, and these can be monitored at the time when an assay is being run. So, however, for any user or for, for any lab, there are important QC metrics that everybody needs to know. Number one being, is the inferred sex of the sample accurate? And so the other is a molecule quality report. And then of course, the assessment of ultra stable regions and everything has to pass. Besides this, we can also see what kind of analysis was performed, what kind of software assembly pipeline was used. So in this case, BioNanoSol 3.5, which version of the FSHD analysis pipeline was used and on which date was this assay run. So this is important for monitoring and tracking of any test, uh, any clinical test. So now let me show you some data. So these are the results of the Coriel cell lines and there were six samples, which you can see over here that were taken through the entire for workflow three times from DNA isolation to analysis. And you can see the published annotation and what was found in runs one, two, and three. Now, the longer allele, um, it really doesn't matter, you know, what the published data is because it's usually not countered because it is the longer allele. We are focusing on the repeat contractions anyway. Um, on this slide, what you can see is the annotation of the short allele, and you can see runs one, two, and three where the short alleles show reproducibility plus minus one repeat contraction. And for the long uh, allele, you can see that we had reproducible results in all the three runs. They were concordant. Similarly, for the normal male and female results, what you can see over here is that the results from chromosome four and chromosome 10, because that's essentially what we want to map and be able to discern. And none of the six control samples had the contracted or the short 4QA allele. And again, you can see the long alleles, and there were some that were uh, we were not able to count. But again, the haplotype uh, is very clearly not the contracted allele. These are the results from the clinically diagnosed FSHD cases. And the same 14 samples were run at the BioNano site in San Diego and also at the Perkin Elmer site in Pittsburgh. And what you can see here is the allele one and allele two measurements. And what you can see is that 12 out of the 14 showed the repeat contraction. However, 773 and 918 samples did not show the repeat contractions. Also, we found um, mosaic, mosaicism or possible mosaicism in two cases, 772 and 830. I wanna show you how the mosaic profile looks like. So if you look at this image, the green is the chromosome four reference, and you can see three maps. You see allele one at the top of the green reference, allele two underneath the uh, green reference, and then the allele three. Now allele one and allele two both show the 4QA haplotype, and you can see the repeat contraction above and the regular non-repeated uh, region below the chromosome four reference. And the third allele or the longer allele looks like the 4QB. We are doing additional studies to confirm this mosaicism in, in this sample. When we ran the same samples um, at our Perkin Elmer genomic site, we saw exactly the same result. You can see over here, 773 and 918 did not observe repeat contractions. And we see the same mosaicism. Now let's go to 773 and 918. What you can see here, if you look at the clinical symptoms, 773 also had severe limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So this was part of a, a, a phenotypic heterogeneity could be happening over here. Similarly, in 918, we can see foot weakness, gait abnormality, but however, we don't see the classic scapular winging or other clinical features. And of course, we did not observe the repeat contractions in these two patients. 
Now, when we ran these uh, you know, 14 samples at the two sites, then we looked at the molecule N50, which is a QC metric. N50 is approximately 200 or greater, uh, 200 kb or greater molecules that are needed as part of a QC. And what we saw was that the perkin elmer genomic site molecule N50 QC metric was slightly lower than when it was run at the BioNano site. So when we looked at it further, then we saw that uh, the centrifugation speed was a little bit higher at our perkin elmer genomics uh, site. And this could have caused slight shearing, and that's why we didn't have those molecule lengths. So we took six of those samples and we reran them, as you can see over here, and we saw an improvement in our molecule N50. So what does this actually tell us? But we measured the haplotype uh, assignments and the repeat counts. And even with this suboptimal quality of DNA or data, what we can see is the haplotype assessment did not change. So we still saw the repeat contractions, which were measured accurately across the two sites, two instruments, two different operators. And this really speaks to the robustness of this assay. So, however, we also wanted to see the other alleles, the 4QB and the 10Q. And what we saw that we, we found exactly the same results in all the samples. Now, remember 772 and 830, we saw mosaic profile and we again saw the same thing at both sites. So to summarize um, these results, we saw excellent performance metrics for assessing the 4QD4 Z4 repeat array. All the samples passed the assay QC and we saw 100% gender concordance. We also assessed 100% analytical accuracy and precision detected with our Coriel cell lines and our negative controls. As I have shown you, Coriel cell lines demonstrated assay concordance in three independent runs plus minus one repeat, and the normal male and female controls revealed a normal range of the D4-Z4 repeats between 15 to 48. We were able to assemble the de novo uh, genomic map of the 4QA and 4QB haplotypes with accuracy, and we were clearly able to discern between the 4Q and the 10Q D4-Z4 repeats with confidence. As I've shown you, 12 of the 14 clinically diagnosed FSHD cases uh, demonstrated the contracted allele with a range of 2 to 8 D4 Z4 repeats. Now remember, repeats between 7 to 10, as I introduced in the beginning, uh, is around the borderline, and that is where additional methylation testing may be um, important in terms of disease severity expression. However, 14 of the 14 clinical samples demonstrated 100% concordance, both inter-site and intra-site reproducibility with those six samples that we repeated at Perkinelmer Genomics. As part of our next set steps, we are typing the 14 clinical samples with alternative methodologies, and we are also validating for large SMCHD1 deletions on chromosome 18. And we are developing recommendations for D4, Z4 contractions in the range of 7 to 10 because we could have asymptomatic carriers where there is no hypomethylation that will not be expressing any FSHD phenotype. And we are also trying to see if an FSHD2 methylation assay can be developed along with finalizing the reporting software tool and launching this test at perkin Elmer Genomics. Uh, there are also other trinucleotide repeats uh, that we are interested in. And this is just a short list uh, that I'm showing you on the right-hand side. And we are looking at if we can use the same uh, methodology and technology for other TNRs um, you know, for our laboratory. Um, this is our perkin Elmer genomics uh, flyer where we are demonstrating that this is now essentially validated and we are doing the final tweaks uh, to be able to offer this testing uh, to patients and families that need genomic testing. 
Uh, this was a team effort. This cannot be done by one individual or a couple of people alone, as you saw the amount of work that was that went in and that was needed to do this uh, development of this assay. But I need to specifically thank uh, Madri Hegre, who is our Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer of Perkin Elmer Genomics, Dr. Suresh Shanoi, Dr. Rajiv Rose, and from BioNano Genomics, Mark Oldakowski, who's the Chief Operating Officer, Sven, Dr. Sven Bockland, Dr. Alex Hasty, Dr. Ernest Lamb, Dr. Henry Sadowski, and Scott Way, who all played a key role in understanding the requirements for reporting, for software analysis, the visualization, and everything that is needed. Of course, uh, the clinicians, Dr. Satish Khadilkar, Dr. Rashna Dastur, Dr. Pradnya Gaitonde, extremely important for recruiting these samples for this validation study and the patients and families that played a role, um, you know, in giving us the clinical samples. With that, I'll take any questions. Um, we have our email on the slide and you have my email on this slide and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.